Every year, thousands of people flock to Alaska and they soak in all the beauty that Alaska has to offer. Or maybe they're sitting at home and they're watching a reality TV show or a YouTube channel such as this one. And based upon the memories that they're making, they decide to move to Alaska. And despite their best efforts to get all the information they can before they arrive, there's always going to be something that's left out of the conversation. My goal is to provide you with those little tidbits of information that maybe you might not be able to pick up elsewhere. Before I moved to Alaska, I did a bunch of research. I wanted to know anything I could about Alaska and more specifically about the area in which I was about to move into. I watched every YouTube channel I could possibly find and listened to what they had to say, as well as the videos that are the things they love about the state and the things that they dislike, as well as the things that nobody tells you. Well. I still experience some things that I've not heard anybody else talk about. And so I want to share my experiences with you so that if you're planning a move or if you're like Star Lead Homestead and you just moved into a rural or remote community within the state, then I recommend that you watch this video because I'm going to share some things with you that might make your move and your initial time getting set up in the state go that much more smoothly. When you first move into a new property, in a rural or remote location, the last thing you expect is for someone to show up on your doorstep with a plate full of cookies, welcoming you to the community. And if your property is like mine and it's situated far back off the road, your new neighbors might not even know that you've moved in. It's also not advisable for you to necessarily go to your neighbor's front door and introduce yourself. There are a number of people in Alaska who simply just don't want to be found. They might be hiding from something in their past or they simply just don't care to be around other people. Either way, they don't know you nor your intention. And even if you show up waving the white flag as you come down the driveway, you might find yourself staring down the barrel of a gun. If you're fortunate enough to be able to tell them what your intentions are, that you're there just to introduce yourself, you might be lucky enough to get them to lower their weapon and offer you a handshake. There's still a high probability that you're going to be told to get the hell off their land and to never do that again. Your best bet is to meet people at one of the local community events or in one of the local markets or businesses and introduce yourself that way. But when you do, a word of advice is to let them do the talking. Get to know what they're all about. Get to know how they view the community and what their pain points are in the community before you start voicing your concerns. But even then, you should not expect to be immediately welcomed into the community. Alaskans pride themselves on their way of life and they don't take kindly to outsiders coming in and looking to make changes in the community. When you finally do get to meet some of the people in your area, expect to be met with some scrutiny and expect to be questioned about where you're at with your political views and your skill set and your knowledge regarding this type of lifestyle. Have you ever lived like this before? Have you ever experienced winters with lows well below zero, the amount of snow that Alaska has to offer, the deadly situations that are present in Alaska from not only the wildlife, but to the road conditions, things like that. They want to know who you are, but I guarantee you, that if you come in with big ideas, that that's where you're probably going to make more enemies than you are friends in the community. So best to get to learn what the community is about and hear what their individual concerns are and take everything they say with a grain of salt and everything should go smoothly for you at that point as far as meeting those in your community. I lived in my cabin for over a year before I actually met any of the other people that live on the road that I live on. My cabin, as I said, sits back far off the road and I don't have a shared property line with anybody. In fact, 
my nearest neighbors are miles away and most of the cabins on this road I believe are just seasonal cabins and they're not occupied year round. When I first encountered somebody it happened to be the local fire chief who I met when a tree had fallen down across the road. After making my initial introduction to him he decided that he would make a welfare check to come and basically find out who I am as I just mentioned. He wanted to know if I had the provisions necessary to make it through the upcoming winter. When I explained to him that this would be my second winter here in Alaska, that I had come from Colorado, what my background was and where my skill sets were, what my provisions were, it put his mind at ease. The people in the community, they want to make sure that you're going to be self-sufficient and that you can sustain yourself for long periods of time, especially when you're living out in the bush, because there isn't going to be anybody who's going to immediately be able to come to your rescue. And they want to make sure that you're not going to be a liability or a casualty within the community. I've heard too many stories since arriving in Alaska about people who have bought property here not knowing what Alaska was really all about. They didn't understand the weather patterns of Alaska, the amount of snowfall that we get, the extreme temperatures that we get. And after a short time, they were ready to pack it up and move on out. And to be honest with you, that is bothersome to the long-term residents of Alaska. They would rather you not come than come here and move out quickly. If you're going to move to Alaska, especially into these more rural areas, do your research, make sure that that community is a good fit for you, but also make sure that Alaska is a good fit for you. Make sure that you understand what you're really up against. If you've been to Alaska and you only came in the warm summer months, you're gonna have a whole different perspective of what Alaska really is than when you come in the winter time and you're dealing with icy roads and moose running across the highway. There's no barriers on those highways, as I've said before, no guardrails and no center dividers for the most part. And you got tanker trucks coming at you full force that you could easily run into head on. It's important that you fully do your research. And I'm trying not to lecture, but I think these are things that people really need to understand and to take into consideration when planning a move to Alaska. <laughs> priority should be becoming a resident. By doing so, you're going to start the clock ticking down to when you're going to become eligible for certain benefits that the state has to offer. One of the most popular benefits, of course, of living in the state of Alaska is the permanent fund dividend, commonly referred to as the PFD. But did you know that you have to apply for the PFD? It's not automatically given to every Alaska resident. In order to be eligible for the PFD, you have to meet certain requirements. The first one is, is that you have to have been a resident for the entire previous year. One thing to keep in mind is if you arrive on January 2nd and you set up your residency that day, you'll have to wait the remainder of that year and the following entire year before you're going to qualify for the PFD. So it's based upon the calendar year, not one year of your time in Alaska. Right now it's November of 2022. So that meant that if I was applying for this year's PFD that got sent out in September, I would have had to been a resident from January 1st to December 31st in 2021. On the date of application, you have to have the intent to remain an Alaskan resident indefinitely. So if you know that you're gonna be moving out of state soon, you might get disqualified if they find out that you knew that prior to your application. Cannot have dual residency. And then there are certain requirements about sentencing and incarceration for felonies and misdemeanors. You also cannot have been absent for over 180 days. And you must have been physically present in Alaska for at least 72 consecutive hours at some point in the last two years. Another benefit of claiming residency in the state of Alaska is that you're going to qualify for in-state hunting and fishing rates, 
which trust me are much lower than what you're going to pay when you come here to visit and you're trying to do these things. Those do run on an annual basis from the time that you set up your residency. So if you set your residency up the day you arrive, 365 days later, you'll be able to get in-state rates. For example, the in-state rate for an Alaska annual fishing license is $20. For an out-of-state individual, it's $100. If you want to purchase an additional King Salmon stamp for in-state residents, that's $10. And for out-of-state visitors, that's an additional $100. So you can see that those fees really start racking up when you're out-of-state um, but once you set up your residency, those fees drop dramatically. So while all residents of the state of Alaska qualify for the state subsistence hunting, only residents of designated rural areas qualify for the federal subsistence hunting. And there's a big difference between the two. For example, on the fishing for salmon, you qualify on the state level for subsistence hunting at 35 fish for an individual. And then for every individual in your household, I believe it's 10 additional salmon on top of that. When you're on the federal subsistence fishing, you get 200 salmon as an individual. And as a family, you get up to 500 salmon annually. So it's 35 annually on the state for an individual, 200 annually for an individual on the federal. But again, it's only certain areas that qualify for that federal subsistence hunting. And so that's one other thing that, you know, could be a benefit of living like this. And the reason that the federal areas are established is because of the native tribes that originally, you know, that were the original inhabitants of Alaska. That was their way of life. And the federal government has allowed that way of life to continue for these native tribes and for some non-native individuals who live in these areas, mainly because it is based upon cultural, social, and economic factors, the economic being in these rural and remote areas, there is little to no industry or employment. And so a lot of the individuals in these areas are reliant upon the hunting and the game and the wildlife that they're able to harvest. Many believe that you merely need to own property in Alaska to qualify for these fishing and hunting privileges, but that's not true. You actually need to establish residency within the state in order to qualify for these. And this is where things begin to get complicated. So stick with me as I explain to you some of the complications around establishing residency in these rural and remote communities in Alaska. <laughs>
to claim residency in the state of Alaska, you need to get your state-issued ID or driver's license. And if you thought that the DMV was difficult to deal with in the lower 48, it's not exactly a walk in the park here in Alaska either, especially in the more rural communities. But before we talk about the DMV, we need to back up just a moment and we need to talk about your physical location in Alaska. Because if you're in a remote or rural location, you're going to find that that's going to be a challenge for you when you go to set up your residency. Now, I'm not an expert on all of Alaska, but I will tell you that what you might find regarding your physical address and your mailing address is that they're probably not going to be one in the same. When you live in the city, you're used to your your home and your mailbox having the same address unless you're using a community mail center or you're using a P.O. box in town. Here in the rural areas, what you're going to find is that your physical location is usually going to be a mile marker. So like mile one of such and such a road where your mailing address is going to be a highway contract address. And that will be something like HC, HC standing for the highway contract, HC five box one, two, three. And you're thinking, so what difference does that make? Well, first let's explain what the highway contract is. The highway contract is where your mail is delivered by a contracted individual who is working with the United States Postal Service as opposed to being an employee of the United States Postal Service. And while this service has dated back well before the last century, you'll find a handful of businesses that their computer systems are not set up to work with these type of addresses. And since that's the address that your mail is gonna be delivered to, you might find that it's difficult to get your banking statements or your credit card statements or bills sent from the lower 48 if they're not familiar with these type of addresses. You're gonna to need to prove your physical location in Alaska, right? You're gonna to need to prove that you're in the particular town, area, or community that you're claiming. And you're thinking, well, I'll just bring my mortgage statement or my deed of trust for the property. Well, those documents probably aren't going to help you out. A mortgage statement might list your legal description, which would be the same on your deed of trust. And a mortgage statement is going to be mailed to your mailing address, which remember is going to be your highway contract address or a PO box if you choose to get one in town. It's not going to have your physical address on it. The deed of trust is only going to have, like I said, the legal description of the property and not list any address. Because of that, you're going to need to go to the post office and you're going to need to send yourself a letter. It could just be an empty envelope or a postcard. You're going to want to address it to yourself with, your, with both your physical location address and your mailing address and have it postmarked through the United States Postal Service. Once you send off that letter or the postcard to yourself and get it postmarked, then the DMV is going to accept that as your proof of location in the community or the area of Alaska that you're claiming. But you're going to have some other issues, especially if you're off grid. They expect you to bring with you a utility bill of some sort. But if you're living in one of these rural areas, chances are you don't have water being plumbed to your, to your property. And so you're not going to have a water bill to bring with you. If you're completely off grid, you're not gonna have an electric bill either. So then what do you do? Well, hopefully you've gotten your phone transferred up to Alaska and you're using an Alaska phone service because then you could bring your, your phone bill. Oh wait, you didn't do that? Let's see, did you get your banking switched to Alaska banks yet? No, you didn't do that either? Then you might be out of luck. Alaska wants to make sure that you're actually residing in the state and that you're truly a resident. And so if you're not doing business here in Alaska, utilities, phone, water, banking, something along those lines, they might not accept your request for residency within the state. So keep in mind that you're going to want to show that you're actually living in your home. They, that is a requirement for all of these benefits is that you're actually a resident and they're going to require you to surrender your residency in your prior state or country when you accept residency here. You're going to need to register your vehicle in Alaska within 10 days of receiving your residency also. So be prepared to do that as well. Did you know that over 61% of the land in Alaska is owned by the federal government? while only a portion of that is open to the public. 
The state owns another 27% of the 365 plus million acres. On top of that, there are 14 native corporations that own 12% of the land here. That leaves just under one quarter of 1% of the land in Alaska that is privately owned land. My point being is that a lot of the land in Alaska, while it's uninhibited, is also not open to public access. In these rural communities, you're going to find a lot of the land is either, like I said, federal, state, or native lands that you're not allowed to trespass on. Some of the federal lands, of course, are going to be like the national park that's behind me, but some of those lands are going to be the native lands that you're only able to trespass on if you do so by permit, meaning that you're going to need to buy a special pass through the native corporations to gain access to their land. Their lands are going to be subject to their own rules and regulations, including some things like you're not allowed to berry pick on their lands or to collect firewood. You might be allowed to fish, hunt, and camp with special permitting. And that's something that I recommend that you look into for the area that you're moving into. In addition to the federal or native lands that you're not allowed to access, you might actually have a trail running through your property that you legally cannot prevent other people from accessing. In the state of Alaska and throughout the United States, there are what's known as RS-2477 trails. RS-2477 stands for Revised Statute 2477, which was an amendment to the Mining Act of 1866. RS-2477 trails stands for Revised Statute 2477 and is an amendment to the Mining Act of 1866. This was adopted to encourage the settlement of the West by development of roads and trails that led across federal lands to otherwise public access or private lands. The act granted a public right-of-way across unreserved federal land to guarantee access as land transfer to state or private ownership. These trails run throughout Alaska as well as the many parts in the United States. Unfortunately, like I said, if they run across your property, you cannot deny someone access to those trails. While RS-2477 trails are not exclusive to Alaska, there are other things that are. So before you buy property in Alaska, check out this video here.